Hey, it's Gerald from Lakers Fast Break. Anchor is the easiest way to make your next podcast. It's absolutely free, and their creation tools will allow you to record and edit your show right from your phone or your home computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on great podcast outlets like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to get started on your next podcast. back for another episode of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast and more of the Pop Culture Cosmos as well. This is Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here. Thank you for listening to all of our great shows. Well, I finally got him here. He's been one of the busiest men on the planet that's not part of the government. And don't get me started on the government because then we'll just have to go into his show, Voice from the Underground. He's here today to talk about basketball and pop culture He's a new dad, and I'm just so happy for him. Congratulations to him and his entire family. I wish them safe and happiness and health continuously for T.J. Johnson Jr., but also <laughs> T.J. Johnson Sr. is now him. here. It is T.J. Johnson, and T.J., just glad to have you back on the program. I, I cannot yes, thank sir. you up for being here. I, I know you're a busy man. Like you said, <laughs> no sleep, but it's all worth it. Hey man, brother. I'm, I'm. I apologize. It took so long to get back, but uh, hopefully things are kind of starting to, to, to. How do I put it? I don't want to say tail off. They're kind of starting to ease and kind of get to a bit of normalcy around here. So, uh, praying it all continues to go that direction. But uh, grateful just to be here, buddy. And there's so much I want to talk about with you today, man. We, uh, there's so much we got to catch up on. Absolutely, my friend. Absolutely. Although Jason is somewhere, Jason Dutch from Voice of the Underground, somewhere going. Hey, why don't you be my show? <laughs> Somewhere around there, you know. You know how he I've is. done the last. I've done the last two uh, voice me on the grounds. I've I've been I've been I've been better. Okay, then you were all <laughs> the ones that I was on at the beginning of the month. So right, 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 so right. It's right. only when I'm <laughs> appearing on your show. That's I see how that is. Okay, it's a me thing. That's okay. All right. That's why I got to come see you on here. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Things have been going well for the Lakers Fast Break and also Pop Culture Cosmos in your absence. Uh, just so many great things to talk about. I mean, pop culture and sports, always something that people want to talk about. I think we'll start off with the NBA and the Lakers Fast Break stuff. I mean, as of today, as we're recording this, it looks a little bit more and more like the NBA will have a season. I was talking to Rafael Barlow from the NBA Draft Junkies.com. Uh, one of the many guests I've had in your absence that have been touching on the NBA draft. And I was joking with him. I said, you know, it's up to the players at this point in time because they had a poll on mm. whether or not they wanted to go ahead and restart the season. But I could hear a collective whew, sigh of relief when all these <laughs> other leagues wanted to go ahead and start. Mm. And the NFL's announced their schedule. They're set on a September day. You're, you're trying to stay to it. Major League Baseball is talking the 4th of July. NASCAR, I've already had a great interview with Marcus De La Garza about NASCAR coming this mm -hmm. weekend. Golf, European soccer, they're all coming around. So the NBA, you know what? Optics is very important to them. Yeah. Yeah. And with the basketball, now you can say, all right, now we can come back. Now people aren't going to complain that we're back or taking up fifteen to 100,000 tests and things of that nature mm -hmm. for frontline workers, taking that away and all that. Although I'm sure they would go through private funds to go ahead and private agencies said so that wouldn't be the case. But your right. thoughts on the possibility of the NBA coming back? What type of season would you like to see? Would you like to see even a tournament take place? I mean, as a basketball fan whose yeah. only fix has been the last dance, and we'll get on that in a second. Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts about the NBA season possibly coming back into fruition, some type of fruition? Well, let, let me start by just saying, God, have we missed sports, man. 
I don't think I realized how much I missed just being in some type of conversation about sports uh, for the last three, four, however long we've been out. It feels like forever we've been on quarantine and self-isolation. So I'm I'm just excited at the prospect of anything sports related. We know we just had some UFC and uh, just just exciting to be able to talk about sports. Um, now, as far as the NBA is concerned, I absolutely think we need to have a resolution to this season. Now, I'm a little biased. We are the number one team in the West, and absolutely. LeBron's not getting any younger. Yes. And uh, we really need to t- to take advantage of the opportunities that we have to put more championship banners up in the Staples Center. This is so. True. Uh, I am definitely on board with the league starting back up again. Uh, I think it's going to be interesting to see, though. Uh, and just the truth is, it's going to be interesting to see because, one, you've got players who have not had ac- access to a basketball uh, hoop, uh, a basketball, or any of the above. You know, just because these players are professional athletes doesn't mean that they're wealthy enough to have a, a court built in their backyards. Or I-, I saw some of them play horse. Yeah, this was yeah. Bad. Yeah, they need some. They need some practice, and it, it's, it's expected. So even if they were to announce, you know, something, they're going to have to give the players at least four to five weeks just to get themselves back into somewhat basketball shape. And then you have these players like a LeBron or some of the older players in the league who don't benefit from having that kind of time off. I mean, a lot of people think you know you'd have a chance to rest and you know recharge, but you know when your body's used to doing a certain thing and you take it out of its routine before it's time. And then you have to try to gear it back up again. That's the type of thing that, you know, Kobe eventually said, I'm, I'm tired of doing. I'm tired of getting my body geared back up for another NBA season. It's just a lot of it's a lot of work to do that. So it's more detrimental to the older players than people realize. Saying all that to say, I do believe that we need to have some type of resolution to the season. I do think that they're going to start it back up. What I'd like to see them do something you and I kind of bounce back and forth a little bit was kind of start a, a, a tournament for the lower seeds to kind of give them a chance to get in there a- again. You know, obviously we know that the season is what the season is and, you know, there's a chance that some of them could have made some noise to get into the playoffs right in the last half of the season. We don't have that opportunity to see that now. So you give them a shot, give them a, a tournament style chance to get into that last, you know, the last three, you know, four seeds of the playoffs, whatever the number may be, um, and allow that to play out as it is. And then just go right into the playoffs. I don't think you need to have another, you know, two weeks of the regular season. I think you you give the teams enough time to practice to get themselves ready. The teams that are going to and then have them play that that tournament. And then after the tournament, go right into the playoffs. I, mean, I don't think you really need to go into this whole making more season, making more time for the season. Let's just get right to the playoffs and get going. Well, there is a thing that they have to meet a certain number of games. Otherwise, they're going to pay some serious hard cash, i.e. meaning the league, uh, back to the regional sports networks. Mm. Uh, So that would be something to think about. I think the number is 70 that they have to reach. Really? Uh, And I think if that's the case, yeah, because I was listening to Mark Stein uh, on a recent Chad Ford podcast mentioned that. And as one of the NBA insiders, I believe that – you know, that's something that has to be made aware of. And if that's the case, that leaves maybe about five, six games, which would be, I think, I, I, okay. Because if you're in an isolated area, whether it's Orlando, Las Vegas, or what's been talked about both, mm-hmm. one, one West Coast and one East Coast, per se, and you knock out those games, you can do that rather quickly because, uh, like I've said before, Mandalay Bay is set willing to set up about 24 courts. Right now in Las Vegas, you could go ahead without any preparation. You could have just go ahead and and there's six arenas you could have going on, playing games at the same time. Orlando, they've talked about Disney World, talking about maybe up to 12 to 14 courts running at the same time. So you can knock out those games in a pretty expedient fashion and still run your tournament. But it would give time for the Lakers, Bucks, and all these other playoffs teams to have some type of, uh, you know, live NBA games, which I think is also needed because if you did the tournament, like you were talking about and the Lakers and and whoever, uh, you know, the Bucks or whatnot, even get a buy, which would be great. But if they don't have any preparation of a live game going into that, I'd say that they would be at a serious disadvantage. Yeah. You know, and as you say that, that makes a whole lot of sense. And I did forget, I did read about them saying that possibly Disney World would be a place for them to hold multiple games. So 
if they do it that way and just kind of get everybody to come to them, very similar to what UFC Dana White was trying to do at UFC and have a private fight island, very Mortal Kombat ish, that would actually be pretty cool. So no, that that, that actually sounds like a great idea. Well, I think yeah. In fact, Laker Tom of Lakerholics.net actually expounded on that. I don't know if he heard it or or was theorizing it that the West Coast would stay in Las Vegas in a concentrated area and the East Coast would stay in Disney World, which would suffice even better if that's the case because you could, you know, knock out theoretically a lot of games there on both sides of the equation and not have to go ahead and have a tremendous amount of travel both ways and then ultimately have a finals at one central location wherever it works out best. That that's up to them. Some type some type of configuration, whether it's all of them go into one area or one, you know, split up between two areas, but trying to keep it concentrated, I think, is is ultimately the answer. But again, like I said, it's all about optics. And two weeks ago, they were worried about optics about having to do so many tests and having the guilt of saying, okay, we got to go ahead and start our league and everybody going ahead and frowning on them. Nobody's frowning on them anymore because everybody's seeing like I said before, all these leagues open up or talk about starting dates or have firm starting dates, or in the case of just, you know, all of us getting back to some type of normalcy, whether or not it's going to work out or not. It's just, it's kind of weird to see because people are going back to work. They're going back to opening restaurants, barbershops, things of that nature. And I know it's exactly not everybody's liking it, Mm -hmm. but it is a reality. And that makes it a whole lot more palpable for the NBA to go ahead and start their season. It, it it does. And, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's all about the optics, right? If they're the ones that are out the gate first, they look money hungry. They look like they're the ones that are just trying to hurry up and, and get the league started back up. We got to make money, got to make money, got to make money. But now that everybody else has started to put out dates, started to implement uh, strategies to restart their leagues or continue their leagues, whatever the case may be, I think it's important now that the NBA says, OK, everybody else is like you said, everybody else has started to do it. Let's go ahead and start to slowly bring forth these tests and now we don't like you said now we don't feel bad use our own funding to get a hold of these tests and yeah i absolutely agree i think that uh what's going to be interesting is you know we're still looking at the way china has responded right china had tried to start up their league and then they had to shut it back down and they're trying to start it back up they're trying to shut it back down so i think they're also paying a lot of attention to what goes on overseas in china um from the standpoint of their successes and their failures even um, in regards to restarting their sports franchises or their sports leagues and, and how they've been able to, or not be able to do so. So uh, I think uh, Adam Silver is, is, you know, I, I I really would be interested to see how David Stern would have handled this. Um, I think we had the right commissioner for the right circumstances in Adam Silver. I really do. I'm a huge fan of David Stern. I, I don't want to make it seem like I, I was not a fan of David Stern because I, I was. He pretty much put the NBA where it is today. Adam Silver is such a progressive, forward-thinking commissioner that's willing to say, you know, we might not have gotten that right or willing to say, you know, we don't have the answers, but we're trying to. And I think that's it's so important to have that level of transparency. Uh, but when I say he's, he's a great a progressive mind, he's just looking at other ways to get the job done. He's not just saying, well, you know what, we're just gonna we're just gonna wait until we're all 100. percent He's like, okay, well, yeah, but let's let's try to figure out other ways to get the same outcome. Let's try to figure out alternative methods. Let's look at you know different ways we can do things. And I, I just I, I appreciate his leadership during this time in regards to what the NBA is and isn't going to do, and how they are not willing to put their players at risk. But at the same token, they understand that you know sports is very and, and again. <laughs> I, I hate to, to sound like a broken record, but I really didn't realize how much we needed sports. I really didn't. It, it was such an integral part of our society uh, from just water cooler moments to just general conversation. I could, I could, I can tell you that I, I've talked about sports quite a bit with just my family alone. And, but we're just talking about old stuff. We're talking about like the last dance. We're talking about things that have happened prior to, and it's just, there's such a desire to such a longing for sports right now. It's a, uh, it's it's palpable. I mean, I, I you could you could feel you can feel the excitement. You really can. I just just thinking about the season getting started back up. I'm excited. I've actually just had this this big smile on my face, trying to understand. Hey, this this could happen pretty soon. Like we could be looking at getting things restarted back here, uh, and it, it's just an exciting time, man. It really is exciting to see the world kind of get back to some normalcy. Again, it's not 
it's not ideal. You know, obviously we still got a lot of challenges and we're not there yet. But the one thing I can say is I, I don't I don't wish to be Trump. I don't wish to be Donald Trump in these circumstances because he really is faced with impossible choices. At a time like this, about trying to get the country restarted, trying to get everything going back to a sense of normalcy, while at the same time being very uh, cognizant of um, people's needs and the fact that you know this virus is still out there. It's not like it's gone away. It's, we're still dealing with it. Um, we're just becoming more. We're becoming smarter about how we do so. Thanks. So I'm excited, man. I am. I know I am too. Although Adam Silver says, you know, it's not going to be on uh, a quick time frame. He's easing it up in. He, he's making sure the players have a lot of buy-in. He's making sure the owners have buy-in. I mean, that's what I like about Adam Silver over David Stern is that he yep. always tries to get the players buy-in. And that's something that's very important. Uh, obviously, the many challenges he's had since he's come into office has been too much debate. And almost every time he's handled it well or been faced with a situation that no commissioner has ever been handed before. Exactly. And I think he's handled, for the most part, really admirably. And I know he's easing the, into this. He's already even said to the players that it's something that we're not going to go ahead and full blast in there. We're going to go ahead and, and just take a cautious approach. But there is a very real possibility of getting this season back underway in some semblance of form. I think a tournament needs to be done, but it needs to be done with all the, the teams because if you get like an Atlanta and a Golden State and mm -hmm. tell them that they have no chance to go ahead and do anything outside of just playing the string at this point in time, I think you're going to get a lot of uh, feedback from them on that. I think that this at least, besides, it would create a lot of excitement and for interest and for ratings, which were going down before the cor coronavirus, I mean, what would it be like to have even a possibility of maybe, say, Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and Draymond Green come back in some semblance form and say, hey, you know what? In a short series, here's a possibility in a tournament, you could actually sneak in and get the eight spot. Yeah. I know it's not fair to Memphis, but you know what? At this point in time, it has to be about what the fans might like to see. You know, I agree, and I, I was actually – very curious to see what would happen with Kevin Durant. Now, I've heard that you know he's shot it down. He's not going to return this season, whether the, the league starts back up or not. But it would have made things very, very interesting for all these players who've been injured. Again, your Clay Thompson, your Steph Curry, who's now had time to uh, continue to heal. Uh, obviously, Steph Curry was already coming back, but has even gotten more time to heal and more time to get themselves healthy. It'd be a lot of fun to see that. Now, I forget where the Warriors record was before, but it was pretty, pretty bottom of the barrel. Yeah, they were uh, bottom of the Western Conference. Yeah. So it, it would be it would make for interesting television to, for them to find a way to sneak into the playoffs. I could just hear the the basketball pundits now and talking about how the NBA is rigged and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if they were to make their way back into it so they wouldn't miss the playoffs. Whatever the case would be, I think it would be extremely exciting. I think it would make it a lot of fun. I think we were comfortable because Golden State was out. You know, Golden State's been down, so we're all like, okay, well, it's anybody's ball game now. And then for all of a sudden, for them to find a way to to sneak in, that would actually make for some very dramatic, dramatic sports, man. That's that's very Dragon Ball Z ish, you know. Right. Where you think he's down, and all of a sudden he gets the Senzu being, and now he's right back in the fight. So it's, I think it'd be kind of cool, personally. I think it would be kind of cool as well. It would bring things to a much better conclusion, I think, for right now. Plus, I know Adam Silver is apt to try the tournament thing. He is, yeah. He's itching to try it. He and is. I do not like the midseason tournament thing at all. Uh, I've said it to you before mm -hmm. on a past broadcast together. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do it, I'd say this is the time to do it. I don't have a problem with it. If you're going to play with – uh, flip-flopping free agency and dra and the draft, now's the time to do it. Yep. If you're going to do anything right now, an experiment, you know what? Now, now is the time to do it, to do it. yes. So, uh, now, here's here's the thing, and this is what I wanted to ask you. You know, Shaq is already going. And Shaq, you know, I love Shaq. I love Shaquille O'Neal. I love what he's been able to do for his career after playing. I love how he's been able to keep himself active and keep himself in the media. But this guy, so he says that – uh they should just scrap the season, and if they were to, to crown a champion, I mean, you know, there's going to be big asterisks by it. I don't understand. I, do you feel like if they were to continue, that it would diminish any champion 
that actually was crowned in this season? No, because they'll be playing what sixty five. They're they're around sixty five games already. Yeah. So it's just like a strike shortened season, if that's the case. But they've already determined who the best teams are and who are the teams that are not as good. I, I don't think it would lessen it at all because you know once it gets to around this time, anyways, during the course of the season, you have these teams that are already checking out. You have these teams that are already thinking, you know what, we're already going to start working for next season. You have already teams that are already just shutting it down. And the Golden State Warriors, we'll go back to them. They would have shut it down around the game 70 anyways. you mm-hmm. know. And, and that's something that I think everybody needs to think about and put in perspective. So if that's the case, to me, it wouldn't be something that you need an asterisk for because you played virtually your entire season anyways. It's not like you right. played only half the season. You've played already two-thirds of the season. I think that should be something that you wouldn't put an asterisk by. And if you have even a shorter, like the old school way, when they were doing two out of three or three out of five type series and whatnot, I don't think that would put an asterisk by it either. I think you're going to get with enough time and enough training camp. You make sure you have enough conditioning and things of that nature. These teams, especially the playoff teams, don't need to make excuses. They're right. either going to be ready or they're not going to be ready, yep. just like they would be in the playoffs. And I still think you're going to go ahead and have the ultimate winner, whether it's the Clippers, the Lakers, the Bucks, or whoever you think the favorite would be. I still think ultimately you would have the the same type of outcome. And also as well, you're going to have someone, a team that's not going to need an asterisk by its name. Right, exactly. I'm, I'm right there with you, bud. Right there with you. We're signaling the ref for a quick timeout, but we'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Check out what's been going on with the Pop Culture Cosmo Show and the PCC Multiverse. I see the potential for basically like another Netflix kind of paradigm shift where here comes this other major player. They have a ton of resources. Apple could change the way that entertainment is consumed. They say it's the only time this year that you'll have stars from each brand battling each other. And we know it's not going to be the case, but they like to say that and more power to them, I guess. Well, it's a big first step bringing all those superheroes together. There were definitely some parts of the movie that I that I really enjoyed. And then there were some parts that I thought just kind of fell short of expectation. Part of it has to be something to do with how it's being promoted. And this is a thing where audiences do not agree with critics. That's the Pop Culture Cosmo Show. And the PCC Multiverse, every week on Apple Podcasts. And over a dozen of your favorite streaming and podcasting options. Well, my friend, there's a little bit more basketball we need to talk about because there's this little docuseries that's going on (laughs) on ESPN. And ESPN is loving it. And obviously the ratings that come along with it as well. It's called The Last Dance featuring Michael Jordan and the Bulls from their last championship season. And I know you said you wanted to see a Kobe one. I mean, there's a lot of footage. I guess he had a documentary team follow him around in his last season, which came as news coincidentally. Okay, not (laughs) coincidentally. Right around the time of the last dance premiering that Kobe had a team of people following him on his last season. So ultimately, Mm -hmm. I hope that comes to fruition and comes to air. Yeah. But your thoughts on the last dance? Uh, I mean, a lot of controversy about the still the things that goes on as far as the hatred, uh, you know, with Scotty Pippen, the, the teammates, like uh, Steve Kerr getting punched out in practice and, and getting a fight with Michael Jordan. Then you hear Charles Barkley and his relationship. And mm-hmm. then you also hear Dennis Rodman in Vegas. You hear those stories and all that. Uh, yeah, it's great. And, and it's, obviously as an educational tool to educate those who are didn't remember it or were too young to remember Mm -hmm. that type of scenario. I mean, your thoughts as someone who is very familiar with the bulls and those championships, your thoughts on the last dance. You know, uh, I've got to say this is probably some of the most riveting television I've seen since uh, trying to maybe the second to last season of game of Thrones last season, game of Thrones, you could, you could throw that away, but uh, this was actually some riveting television. I, I got to say, I, I set a DVR to it. My wife and I make sure we're together and we watch those episodes together and it's riveting as a Chicagoan, as native Chicagoan, uh, I was around for all of those championships. So I can remember not as well the first three, cause I was still pretty young. They were 91, 92, 93. So I was, first, second, third grade. 
but you know when you got into the 96 97 98 stuff you know that's junior high getting to be close to high school i can i can remember those very very vividly and i remember the buzz in the city i remember how electric it was to be in chicago around the time the bulls were making the playoff runs you can just see everything was starting to to really turn be the way that my family would sit in front of the television glued to every every jump shot and the way I became glued to every jump shot watching this documentary. If I can be Frank has really reignited my love for the game. Um, and not that I ever lost it, but it, it kind of was very, it kind of got dormant. Does that make sense? It kind of got a little dormant. It got a little, you know, by the numbers painting by the numbers, but watching that, it kind of really took me back to my childhood and what I loved about the game of basketball, the physicality of it, the beauty of it, the agony and defeat, the the jubilation with victory. It, it, it just took me back to those moments as a child where I, I truly fell in love. And I, I forget that it was really Michael Jordan was the one that really gave me my first desire of, of learning to play the game of basketball and gave me my first real look at, man, I would love to be able to do what Mike does. And everybody wants to be like Mike. I remember the documentaries. I remember the the VHSs. Yes, I remember VHSs and all the rare air VHSs and the different Mike's Playground, different mockumentaries, if you will, or whatever. They Little advertisements for Michael Jordan. But I remember watching those and just thinking, man, I'd love to do what he does. So I love to try to figure out ways to hang in the air like he does and hit last second jump shots the way he does. And this documentary really... It solidified a lot of things in regards to what I've always felt about Mike. You know, a lot of people are going to look at this documentary and think that he was this, this complete just jerk and just terrible teammate. And while I don't disagree vividly, I don't disagree 100 percent. I will say that it was a different era. You know, players played differently. Players were handled differently. Teammates handled each other differently. It was just a different league. And what I think a lot of people have to remember with this documentary is that we're look, we're getting a very, very intimate look at a very, very private thing. You know, they don't keep they don't let cameras and practices typically for for reasons. You know, it's a very, very intimate. It's very private. It's very personal. So for us to have that kind of access is really, really, really rare territory to be in. So when looking at this documentary, we have to remember that we're talking about guys playing a sport, extremely competitive guys top athletes in their in their in their class um, so it's it's hard to turn that off and on whether there's the camera there or not it's hard to say okay i'm not going to be this a type personality because there's cameras in front of me i'm going to be who i am you know i can't turn that off and on so we're getting to see these guys in raw form in regards to jordan he was always focused on winning this was not a surprise and anybody that's looking at this documentary and is shocked that who they're seeing michael jordan is clearly didn't pay attention you had no idea who you were dealing with i mean i don't know if you thought that that he was just going to be this super super nice guy like i don't know if you're expecting him to be like lebron or expecting him to be this like super friendly bubbly jordan was never that guy jordan i expected was- him to be a jerk he was yeah. a jerk man you could see it clearly he, wait he interacted with teams on the sidelines. Yes. You could watch the games on WGN. Yeah. You know, there were broadcasts all over the country, and you could see it. You know, he, yeah. he treated these guys like dirt at given points of time. He only had a select few friends. I mean, mm-hmm. it doesn't take a genius to figure it out that during that time. So, I mean, yeah. it's, to me, it's just a more enlightening for other people, mm-hmm. younger people that don't mm-hmm. know who really who he is, other than the guy that they see on the logo for Nike. So mm-hmm. it, to me, it's just something that it's it just reaffirms what I already knew. Yep. Just the crazy stories that I've heard over the years about Scottie Pippen and yeah. obviously Dennis Rodman. You know, mm-hmm. it's just those stories seem to get solidified in this last dance, and that's something I, I that's the part I only really cared about because I already knew about Jordan. Jordan exactly. is, is, is brilliant, but yeah. it, a lot to create that brilliance, and I think a lot of it rubbed off on Kobe. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and you know, if if you're not liked, oh well. It's just you want to win, and you win at all costs. And it, we're not here to be friends. You know, we're here to win, and that's all that matters. You know, but what I what I will say in Jordan's defense, because and I've been very very critical. My my father in law, my father in law, and I have been having a lot of discussions about this last dance, and we've been having a lot of discussions about if anybody would ever be able to surpass Michael Jordan as the greatest that have ever played, and if LeBron is somebody who can be in the conversation and. 
you know, rather you think he is or isn't, the fact of the matter is, you know, we've had a lot of conversations about Michael Jordan as a teammate. Here's what I would say. I would say that, like you, yeah, Michael Jordan was a bit of a jerk. Michael Jordan was a bit of a, a pushover, uh, not a pushover. He was a bully. Michael Jordan was very, very much, uh, you're going to get on this train or we're going to run you over and we're going to make it very well known. Here's where I, 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 I kind of respect what he was doing. And this is going to sound really, really funny because I was vehemently fighting against my father-in-law about this. He said something on, on, I want to say it was episode eight or episode seven. He said something at the end of episode seven that was very riveting, but he also said something during episode eight, I believe. And what he was saying is that leadership comes at a price. Winning comes at a cost. You know, leadership comes at a cost. You're, you're going to be the one to make those decisions. You're going to be the one that has all that stuff on your shoulders naturally. So you're going to put on this, this persona, you're going to put on this, this, this cape and you're going to, you're going to be that person. It, it, It comes at a price. Now, he said something that made a lot of sense. He said when he first got into the league, when he first became a member of the Chicago Bulls, you know, he was beat up. You know, the bad boys, Pistons beat him up, you know, and I'm sure it wasn't just the bad boys. It, was, it wasn't just the Pistons, the New York Knicks. He had fights with the Cavaliers. He, Austin Celtics, he would go to war, the Lakers, he would go to war every single game. Watch so, out, man. Watch out for the Danny Age. He might bite you. Yeah, yeah he just might. <laughs> he just That's might. Rolling. Bill Lambeer, man, you don't want to catch that clothesline. Rick yeah, Mahorn, right. maybe. Hey, so saying that to say, he's earned the right to kind of be this elder statesman that wants to do things a certain way. He's been there. He was, he was there from the ground up. He started from the bottom. Now they brought him to a championship contending team. Um, so I can respect what he's done. I can respect what he did. And he said something else that was actually very, very interesting. You know, he he was going at Steve Kerr, right? And we all know about the infamous punch and, you know, the black eye and so on and so forth. But what he was saying to Phil was that, Phil, if I can't, if these guys can't handle me riding them and I'm their teammate, what are they going to do against Detroit? What are they going to do against Boston? What are they going to do against New York when these guys have no care for them whatsoever? I'm trying to get something out of them. I'm trying to pull a fire out of them. Sometimes they, the fire may be there. Sometimes the fire may not be there. But I'm trying to pull something out of these guys. What's going to happen when they go face Detroit and they get beat up way worse than what I'm doing? They're going to crumble. I need these guys ready. If we're going to go to war, I have to get these guys ready to go to war. You may not agree with his methods. You may not agree with the way he wanted to go about handling it, but I can appreciate that there was a thought process. It wasn't just Michael Jordan's going to be a jerk. Does that make sense? It wasn't just I'm going to wake up today. I'm going to be this just, just, just jerk. He says, I need to get the most I can out of these guys. This is the only way that I know how. Being from an old school mentality, this is how I know to do it. I've got to push these guys. And if these guys don't respond, then they're not for this team. And you also got to see Phil Jackson, the Zen master himself. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the way he would go ahead and push the right buttons, obviously, mm-hmm. to get, you know, both with the Lakers and with the Bulls. Yes. And that, if that means. Dennis Robin can go on a two day bender in Las Vegas. You know, that's going to be the <laughs> way it is. A week. <laughs> exactly. So, I mean, it's just something that you could see. I think that's also an underlying theme is the way Phil Jackson handled this team. Obviously, the way he handled and dealing with Michael Jordan on a daily basis mm-hmm. and his competitiveness and his fire, making sure it's at the point, like you said, where he pushes his teammates, but not going too far. Uh, right. I think there's there's a point where even that's enough. That's enough mm-hmm. before, you know, so you can say, you know what, you need to go ahead and check yourself just a little bit in order to go ahead and keep having the team go forward. Yep, absolutely. You you got to find a way. And this is this is where, you know, I don't know Phil had these conversations with Kobe as well. You've got to find a way to ingratiate yourself with your teammates. You know, the one thing Michael did is Michael didn't ingratiate himself with his teammates. They either did what Michael wanted to do or that was it. You know, it was it was a different ball game, you know, then. So when Kobe comes along, you know, Phil had conversations with Kobe saying, you know, you've got to figure out a way to ingratiate yourself with these guys. If you want these guys to go to war with you, you've got to relate with them. You've got to be down in the trenches with them. And I think that's something that Kobe eventually learned towards the end of uh, towards the you know later part of his career. In the beginning, he was obviously who he was, the flashy, egocentric, um, very uh, I'm going to do it my way and. Uh, he ultimately got on board 
Uh, but it took him some time. It took him some maturity. It took him some 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 learning, some growing pains, right? So, I think it's just a matter. It, what we're seeing is a is an old school method, and we're seeing a, a muse of Michael Jordan, if you will, and, and the way he processed, the way he did what he did, the way he thought, why he did it. We're seeing the most petty, <laughs> the most petty person in the history of petty. Michael Jordan will find a way to get pissed off about the smallest, smallest thing. He will make up something just to get him going. And I think that's what happens when you're so good that you kind of just coast and you kind of just do things. You have to kind of create games within games to keep yourself truly engaged, which is what Michael Jordan would do. So he would find whatever fuel he could to to light just to get him fired up about playing against your team. Uh, we really are seeing something that that I don't think you'll ever see again. I don't think anything like Michael Jordan's mentality or psyche will ever be replicated because we're just not we're not that anymore. You know what Kobe I mean? Kobe used to do a lot of those same things. Kobe was close. Yeah, Kobe was close. Kobe is the only person that has gotten close, but I, I guess my point in saying that is we don't see any more of it. Oh, I don't man. see anybody that's going to be going forward being able to have that same mentality. That's just not the way the league is set up anymore. No, no. All the all the players are friends now. They all have the same agents. They all run the same circles. They all work out on the offseason together. So it can't really be the same. Right. Uh, we live in an environment where human resources are much more <laughs> important to yep. organizations and teams and things of that I nature. So. The optics, of course, social media and things of that nature. So, yeah, it's going to be hard for us to ever see someone like Jordan or Kobe be full on Jordan or Kobe once again. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I tell you what, man, if, if they do have footage of Kobe's last year, I think it'd be, riveting. It be the case. Yeah, it'd be riveting television to see. However, I would rather see Kobe's, I would rather see full on footage of Kobe's when he was Kobe, you know, his last season while he was Kobe, don't get me wrong, but he wasn't like, I'm going out and I'm killing you every game. Kobe, this was Kobe, the basketball uh, savant who was riding off into the sunset. This was the Kobe that knew that, you know, this was going to be his last season. and was kind of enjoying the ride still being competitive, but you know, he wasn't dropped 81 points on the Toronto Raptors. Kobe. I'd want to see if, if they can do a documentary very similar to the last dance to where you're getting, a bit of the end with a bit of the beginning or begin a bit of the middle or, you know, how they kind of go back and forth like that. If you can do it that style, I'm all in, but I, I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I can handle just the all at the end Kobe, because while I love everything that I can get my hands on about Kobe Bryant, the truth is that last year, Kobe was not the Kobe that we all grew up with that last year. Kobe was not the, the black mamba assassin. I'm coming for your throat. I'm going to keep you down with my foot. Kobe. That was the, you know, shake hands, smile. Kobe smiled more in that last season of his, of of basketball than he had smiled his entire career. So that wasn't the same Kobe. So that's not the Kobe that I always, that's the Kobe I, I, I always remember, but that's not the Kobe that is near and dear to my heart. The Kobe that's near and dear to my heart was the fierce competitor Michael Jordan esque Kobe, and that last season was not that Kobe. So I want to see some footage, yes, but I want that to be juxtaposition because I don't ever want people to forget who Kobe was. That last year wasn't just Kobe. I'd love to see the last year that he and Shaq were together. I'd love yes, to see yes, that last. Well, you know what? No, because that was the that was the that was the rape case year. That two thousand four. Oh, that was, that was that rape was, case uh, year. Yeah, that yeah. was that was the year with Carl Malone. Yeah, I want to see the year before that. I want they, I want the year before that. No, I want that year. I want that year. They got off to a great start, and then Gary Payton, Carl Malone, they both wondered why they were there by the end of the season. Uh, Kobe and Shaq wanted to kill each other. Yep. You had uh, it, Phil Jackson. His Zen mastery was running out per yep. se, and he didn't want anything to do with it. So yeah, that. Actually, you know, I kind of like that kind of drama. So, yeah, I'd like to kind of see that. that <laughs> okay, well, that would have been fun. And then the, the, that the, would be the year, that one in the year right after Kobe's first year as, okay, I'm the man. This is what, this is my team. This is what we're doing. And how he goes by the tax those other teams. I, I would like to see that because he had to turn into a leader at that point. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be back with more of the Lakers Fast Break Podcast. Needing an edge for your fantasy football team? 
Listen to the guys at Inside Sports Fantasy Football for insight that will help you reach your league championship. That's Inside Sports Fantasy Football. Check it out today on your favorite podcast outlet. I will tell you this, my friend. I'm just so happy for you and your family. Uh, obviously, Amen. bringing TJ Jr. to this world, not under the best of circumstances, but he's safe. He sounds very healthy, as he <laughs> was uh, just a little while ago. But uh, you know what? I cannot thank you enough for spending some time with me. I know you're extremely busy doing all the things that you're doing, but Amen. I'm looking forward to speaking to you again, whether it's on the Lakers, NBA, or you know, if you have time to talk some pop culture, you know you're always – we haven't even gone into Marvel movies, and that would take another hour. <laughs> yes, it would. And I've got some things to say about those movies too, so we're doing this again. <laughs> we are doing this again real soon. I'm, I'm yes. just so thankful and so so happy for you. I just – again, my thoughts are with you, your family. Just stay blessed, stay mm-hmm. healthy, and try to stay out of Jason Dutch's hair, please. <laughs> Hey, I make no promises about that. That's what keeps my world going around right there, buddy. All right. Well, there you go. Once again, it's TJ Johnson from Voice from the Underground. Right here at the Lakers Fast Break Podcast.